Well, welcome to week number 13 in Psych 1040 here at the University of Queensland. And this is the last lecture for this course, and it's covering chi-square tests. So the chi-square, as I mentioned in the last lecture, was something that was developed by uh, Pearson, who gave us the Pearson correlation coefficient. And it, it covers a situation with data that we haven't really covered yet. Now to understand this a little bit, let me give you some like an example here. And this is a picture I think, I believe, comes from the schoolies week at the uh, Gold Coast in, in Queensland that happens at the end of uh, November and for year 12 students. I never went myself, but it looks like it's a lot of fun. Now imagine that you decide that you're gonna go to schoolies to do a research project. And you're doing this for a marketing firm that's interested in expanding um, a different new soft drink into Australia, all right? So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have nominal variables only, just categorical variables in which we're gonna do counts. We're gonna look at the frequencies in which people pick different drinks. So here in our example, we have 100 schoolies at the Gold Coast, and they're asked to try three unlabeled soft drinks and then pick the one that they like the best. And here are the results. So of the 100 schoolies that we tested, 40 of the five of them picked the Coke product as the one they liked the best, 30 of them picked Pepsi, and 25 of them picked LNP. Now, if you don't know what LNP is, it's basically the national soft drink of New Zealand, and it's really quite good, and you can find it here in Australia. Now, let's just say that's what we find. Coke, Pepsi, and LNP are the three drinks, and in terms of what they, uh, what the generation of the frequencies were out of 100. So the question is, do the schoolies actually significantly prefer one beverage over another? Is that just something that could happen by chance anyway? Um, is it really something that um, tells us that Coke is like significantly more than Pepsi and LNP? Now, to approach this problem, what you have to do is think about, well, let's say that these drinks were equally liked. So if they were equally liked, what would the percentages be that we would expect for each of them if there was no bias in that population? Well, what you would expect then is of any particular sample of people, if you have three different drinks and they're all equally preferred, that Coke should come out 33.3% of the time, Pepsi would come out 33.3% of the time, and LNP would be 33.3% of the time, okay? So we call these percentages or these frequencies, if you wanna convert them to um, numbers that come out of 100, as our expected values. And so you can see here, I've made a column of expected frequencies or expected percentages, 33.3, 33.3, 33.3. Now again, because I'm using 100 as my sample size, my frequencies actually would be 33.3, 33.3, 33.3. But what I actually observed was 45, 30, and 25. So to understand whether or not the drinks are being significantly preferred uh, differently, um, what I do is I make a new column here that's the differences between the observed and the expected. So I would take that 45% or the 45 out of 100 and subtract the expected value from it, 33.3. And you can see then that Coke is actually liked 11.7% more than what we would have expected just by chance that Pepsi is like less than minus 3.3% than you would expect by chance, and LNP is minus 8.3%. So those are our differences, our O minus the E's. It's this new amount of difference that this new hypothesis test will focus on. So this new hypothesis test, this new chi-square test is called a chi-square test for goodness of fit. So the null hypothesis would be, in this case, that the population of schoolies prefer all drinks equally. The alternative hypothesis that we'll take if we reject the null hypothesis is that the population of schoolies don't prefer all these drinks equally. And it turns out that for our comparison distribution here, our sampling distribution or this comparison distribution is gonna be a chi-square distribution that has a certain degrees of freedom associated with it. So that's our new statistic. Like we had a T before, we had a Z, we had an R. Now we have this new statistic called a chi-square. So it has this Greek lover letter that looks like an X uh, square, that's chi-square. And the formula for chi-square is the sum of the O minus the E for each observation and expected value. Take that difference, square it, and then divide by the E. So translated, I'm gonna compute the O minus the E. I'm gonna square each O minus the E, 
Then I'm going to add them all up and divide by E. And I'll just do this for all of the categories. Okay, so I'm going to compute the O minus the E, square the O minus the E, divide it by the E, and then repeat this for them all, and then sum across all of the categories. So for our example here, our chi-square would be 11.7, which was that difference between what was expected and what was observed for Coke. Square that, divided by 33.3. Then I'm going to take the minus 3.3 for Pepsi and square it, divide it by 33.3. Then I'm going to take my minus 8.3 squared for the LNP and divide it by 33.3. That would give me 4.11 plus 0 0.33 plus 2.07. And that gives me finally a chi-square value of 6.51. All right. So now that I have this chi-square, this value of 6.51, what I'm going to do like I do in any other hypothesis test is I need to compare that statistic to some cutoff. Now, chi-square distributions are always positively skewed, okay? They have a positive skew to them. They're always greater than one, so they don't have any values that are going to be negative. And they do change, they do have different shapes as a function of their degrees of freedom. And the degrees of freedom here will be the number of categories that were free to vary. So that's the number of categories minus one. So what would be the number of categories here? Well, we had three categories, Coke, Pepsi, and L&P. So three minus one is two. So in our example, the degrees of freedom is going to be two. So then what we have to do is look this up in a chi-square table and figure out what is the cutoff when you have degrees of freedom of two. And let's say that we want an alpha to be 0.05. So just again to show you, this is what a chi-square distribution looks like for different degrees of freedom, for three, for degrees of freedom of four, degrees of freedom of five. And you can see that they're always positive values, right? So they're always going to be um, positive. You're not going to have any negative uh, chi-squares. And what you can also see is that it really does matter what the degrees of freedom are, where the tail is, and how much is going to be 0.05. So this is really always a one-tailed test. We don't really talk about there being a two-tailed test for a chi-square. It's always one-tailed. It's that tail over on the right. And we have to figure out where the 0.05 in that tail is for particular degrees of freedom. So luckily, the tables for uh, chi-squares are pretty small. Here's one. It only really has, like this one only has 10 degrees of freedom because it only has to do with the number of categories that we would have. And it's hard to imagine cases where you have more than 10 categories. But this table, I'll make this available upon Blackboard. This is the table that you could use then to find the cutoff. So you remember that our degrees of freedom is two. And if we choose alpha to be 0.05, then that intersection in the column where 0.05 is and the degrees of freedom is two, is 5.991. So that's our cutoff, 5.991. If our chi-square, chi our obtained statistic, is greater than that, then we can reject the null hypothesis. So for a cutoff for degrees of freedom of two, alpha 0.05, it's 5.991. Our chi-square that we computed was 6.51. This exceeds the cutoff, so we can reject the HO. And we can say that these preferences are significantly different, um, that there is some difference here, that, you know, that Coke is liked more than Pepsi, which is liked more than L&P. And in order to say this in APA style, you can say the preferences are significantly different, comma, and then you'd report it like this, where you give that chi-square symbol. Then in brackets, you put the degrees of freedom. I wrote there two. Now, a convention that some people have started to put is the sample size, because otherwise you don't really have an idea of what the sample size is from the degrees of freedom, since that only has to do with categories. So here what I've done is I put in n equals 100 in the brackets so that I can have that value. <coughs> and you can see that it equals 6.51 comma p less than 0.05. So that was my 0.05 was my cutoff uh, alpha, my alpha level I picked. So I can say p less than 0.05. So again, if you go back and look at this particular example, you'll see that it's quite different from what we've been doing in previous weeks. That is, rather than using continuous variables as our dependent variable, as we did with t-tests and correlations, here we're looking at frequencies as they differ by levels of nominal variables. So right now I just have one nominal variable, 
but we can even do this with multiple nominal variables. But let me first show you just how we do this in Jamovi. So Jamovi has this ability to do chi-score tests, and it's pretty simple. Now, what I've done here is I've actually created a data set with our 100 schoolies here. So you can see as we scroll down here, here are the 100 different schoolies. And then I have down here what drink they picked as the, of, the, of the three, Coke, Pepsi, or L&P. Um, I have another variable over here, which is what, where is the state of their high school? Was it Queensland or New South Wales? Um, we'll look at that in a little bit. But for now, let's just focus again just on this variable of, of the drink. How do we do this in Jamovi? So what you do is you go up here to Analyses. And by the way, I just want to double check here. You'll make sure that drink is a nominal variable. That's important here. And it's got these three levels, Coke, Pepsi, LNP. So I go over here now to Frequencies, and I can pick what's called the goodness of fit test, right? So I pick this one, and all I have to do is pick which variable it is that I'm going to be looking at. So I'm gonna go ahead and put the drink here as the variable. And down here it says expected proportions. Now what's gonna happen by default is just going to assume that these three things occur equally likely under the null hypothesis. So you can see that it says here a ratio of one to one to one means that I'll have 0 0.33, 0 0.33, 0 0.33 as my expected values, my expected proportions when the null hypothesis is true. Why this would matter is that if you have some reason to expect that these aren't gonna be equally um, likely to occur when the null hypothesis is true, um, you can change them by changing the values here and that will change those proportions. But in the way I have this particular problem set up, I went ahead and just made it so that we are expecting that if there's no preference here, then they should be equally liked. So you can see over here again, here's my count. 45 people picked Coke, 30 people picked Pepsi, LMP 25. And then finally down here, here's my chi-square, 6.50. It's a little bit different from what I did by hand because of rounding. There's my degrees of freedom of two, and here's my exact p-value, 0.039. So again, it's less than 0.05. Um, it is 0 0.039, so since I have that exact p-value, I could report that now since I used Jamovi to do this. All right, so, so far I've showed you what happened when we just had one nominal variable, the drink that the person picked. Let's try now a more complicated situation where we have a second nominal variable. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to look at the intersection of two different categorical variables to see if there's a relationship between those two variables on whatever our dependent variable is. So in addition to recording the student's drink preference, we also record where the student's high school is located. And what we find is that we have Queenslanders and New South Wales students here at schoolies. 40 of them from Queensland picked the Coke, five of those Coke drinkers were from New South Wales. Pepsi, well, 15 of them were from Queensland, 15 of them were from New South Wales. And for LNP, well, five of those were from Queensland, but 20 of them were from New South Wales. So, no, we still have 100 students, just like we had before, but we've added this extra information now, this extra category that we're crossing this with. You can see we've kind of crossed where the state is that their high school is with what drink that they picked. And you can see that I still have my original 45, 30, and 25%. So now what I can do is look to see if there is some difference for that 45, 30, and 25% breakdown as a function of where they went to high school. Does the preference for a particular soda vary depending on where the student goes to high school? So this kind of chi-square test has a different name. Our last one was called a goodness of fit test. This one's called a chi-square test for independence. It's testing whether or not where the person went to high school is independent from where what drink they picked as their favorite drink. So we're gonna test whether drink preference is independent from high school location. We use the same chi-square formula and we basically use all the same stuff for a chi-score test, we just need to compute these expected values differently this time. Because what we're gonna do is we're gonna take into account how many of the people were from Queensland, how many of them from New South Wales, as well as how many people picked Coke, how many people picked Pepsi, and how many picked LMP. So what you can see now is I've gone ahead and created what I call row totals. So I can see across the, the people who were from Queensland, there were 60 people or 60% of my sample from Queensland. 40 of the people, 40% of the sample is from New South Wales. And then in the columns, I still have those original uh, frequencies and percentages that I had before. So what I have to do now that I have six different cells, 
You see, I have six cells by crossing a two by three. Um, that gives me six different cells in this table. I need to find the expectancy in each of those cells. So I take the E and it's equal to the R divided by the N times the C, where the E is the expected frequency for that cell. R is the number of cases that are in that row. N is the total number of cases overall. And finally, C is the number of cases in the column. So I'm going to take the total number of cases in the row, divide it by n, and then multiply that by the number of cases in the column, and that will give me the expectancy for that particular cell. So I need to repeat that six times. So for example, for the Coke Queensland cell, so just that upper left corner where I have 40 people there, um, what I'm going to do to figure out that E is I need to take what the row total was, 60, divided by the total n, which is 100, and multiply it by the column total, which is 45. So I have 60 over 100, multiply by 45. That means that my expected value would be 27. Then if I do this for the next one over, the one that's for Pepsi in Queensland, you can see that that's 60 over 100 minus, sorry, to, uh, multiply by 30, and that gives us an expectancy of 18. So I put an 18 in for the Pepsi cell. And I would do that again for the lower left corner where I have New South Wales and Coke. That would be 40 in the row total divided by 100. 45 is my column total. So when I take 40 over 100, multiply it by 45, I end up with an expectancy of 18 and so on. So you can see these are all the expectancies, 27, 18, 15, 18, 12, and 10, that you would expect if there is no relationship, if these two variables are independent of each other, where a person went to high school and what their favorite drink is. If those are truly independent, which is what the null hypothesis is basically testing, then these would be my expectancies. So just like I did before for the goodness of fit test, I need to go ahead and find my chi-square. And I use the same formula for chi-square that I had before. It's just that, like I said, now I have more cells or more uh, conditions here to pay attention to. So what I've done is I've gone ahead and figured out each O for each of the six cells, 40, 15, 5, 5, 15, and 20. The expectancies, which we just did in the previous uh, slides, 27, 18, 15, 18, 12, and 10. Then I've made a new column, which is the O minus the E. And you can see I have 13, minus 3, minus 10, minus 13, 3, and 10. Then I need to square the O minus the E. So I get 169, 9, 100, 169, 9, and 100. And finally, in the last column, you can see that I've taken that squared number and I divided it by E, whatever the expectancy was for that particular condition or that cell. So that gives me 6.26, 0.5, 6.67, 9.34, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5,
And then under frequencies, I picked this one here where it says independent samples or chi-square test of association. That's what they call it in Jamovi. And so now what's going to ask me to do is to indicate what's going to be in the rows and what's going to be in the columns. I'll go ahead and put drinks in the rows and I'll put state in the columns. And then I'm going to go ahead and go down here a little bit and see what else I have. I have my statistics, which is my chi-square. And I'm going to test that the hypothesis is that group one is not equal to group two. That's just basically our null hypothesis anyway. Um, and when I look over here on the contingency tables, you can see now that I've got that same contingency table. That the contingency table, by the way, is a table where we've got one nominal variable crossed with the other nominal variable. And you can see here that I've got the same row and column totals that I had before. I could, by the way, just easily change this by saying I want this and this to be switched so that I put the state in the rows and the drink in the columns. And I'll end up getting a slightly different table. This one looks closer to what I actually had in my slides. Um, it'll give me the same chi-square value. And you can see here, actually, there is the chi-square value, 33.56, close again to what I calculated by hand, the degrees of freedom of 2. And this one has a p less than 0 0.001. So this is a very small p-value, which means that this is definitely a real effect. we got a chi-square here that's quite significant in the sense that it's like 0 0.001. So there is my chi-square value. Again, this is, if I do this all in Jamovi, I have an exact p-value. I can say p is less than 0 0.001 instead of p less than 0 0.05. And I can go ahead and then make my um, conclusions that there is a relationship between where a person goes to high school and what their favorite drink is. So you've now learned the two major kinds of chi-square tests, the chi-square test for goodness of fit and the chi-square test for independence. Um, there are effect sizes associated with chi-square tests, so that you know that there is some association between your variables, like there is an independent test, or that there's some deviation from some sort of specified probabilities, like equal thirds for the goodness of fitness test. So the question then is, what is the effect size? If you were going to report an effect size here, what would you do? Well, there is no Cohen's D here, because we can't just do what we did with a Cohen's D, where we looked at the difference between two groups divided by the standard error. Um, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use two other options. Um, there are many options, actually, for chi-square tests for effect sizes, but the two most common ones are phi and Kramer's V. Now, the phi statistic looks like this. What you do is you just simply take your chi-square value, divide it by the n for the total sample size, and then take the square root of that. And whatever that number is, is your phi statistic. It'll be a number between 0 and 1. So that could be a effect size that you could use. The problem is that this particular phi statistic doesn't work too well if you have a table that's greater than 2 by 2. So for example, in the example that I just gave you, we had a 2 by 3 uh, table. And that 2 by 3 table then wouldn't work very well for a phi statistic. So this wouldn't necessarily be the thing to use in that case. The better, more robust kind of effect size that people use in chi-squares is what's called Kramer's V. And what you see here for Kramer's V is that, again, we have our chi-square statistic in that numerator, and then we divide it by the n, but the n is multiplied by k minus 1. Now this k is a little bit more complicated. k is simply whatever is the greatest number of rows or number of columns that you have. So you have to look at both your rows and columns. If you have three rows and two columns, the greater number would be three. So then it would be three minus one. If it's four rows and four columns, it's a tie. So then it would be four minus one. So whatever the no highest number of rows or the highest number of columns is goes into the K. And then you subtract one from it and multiply it by N. That would be in the denominator. So you then take your chi-square divided by that number, take the square root of that, and you have Kramer's V. So again, you get a number that goes between 0, which means that you have no association between these two variables at all, and 1, which would be a perfect association, a very large effect size. You can again do this in um, Jamovi. So let me just show you quickly how we do that in Jamovi. So here in Jamovi, in order to get this, you can just see that down here, under statistics, I can pick phi and Kramer's V, and I get both of them at once. Um, now, it can't actually compute the, the phi coefficient here because it has a 2 by 3 table, so that's why it didn't give us a phi coefficient. But it did give us Kramer's V, which is 0 0.58. So 0 0.58 
is pretty high, you know, moving towards the zero to one scale here of a perfect relationship or a perfect association. Um, so we consider that to be a, a very big effect size. We have a big relationship between where a person goes to high school and what their favorite drink is. And there's the 0.58 that tells us that. So you could report this effect size, Kramer's V, in your um, conclusions, just like you did when you reported the D when we were doing a, a Cohen's D. Now, before we finish up talking about the chi-score tests, I just want to go ahead and mention some assumptions of chi-score tests that are important for us to use this goodness of fit or the chi-score test for independence. First of all, one of the assumptions of the chi-score test is that the expected frequencies have to be sufficiently large. Now, that's sort of a vague assumption, but generally speaking, you want to have expectancies in each of your cells to be greater than five, okay? So if you have a two by three table, none of those expectancies should be, um, well, most of those expectancies should be larger than five. And you should definitely not have any that are zero. So having an expectancy for a particular cell that's below one would mean that you didn't meet this particular assumption of the chi-square test and you shouldn't therefore use the chi-square test for independence, for example. So that's one of the assumptions of the chi-square test, that you get these relatively large, something greater than five for each of your expectancies in each of the cells. The second assumption is a little bit harder, and this is again this thing about independence, that the data are independent of one another. That is that these observations that you're making are independent of each other. So for example, perhaps that you made sure that your schoolies participants didn't hear each other's answers because maybe if their friends said that they really like drink number three, that would influence the next person in line and they would pick number three as well. And so you see the observations then wouldn't be independent. And if they're somehow influencing each other, then you'll be violating this assumption. So this is again pretty hard to do in practice to make sure that every observation is independent of another one, especially if you're picking relatives or friends or whatever it is based on the testing environment. So there are some alternatives to using a chi-square for independence if this is actually the problem that you have. And those alternative tests would include the McNamara test, McNamara test, um, which is in um, Jamovi, or the Cochrane test. And I'm not gonna cover either one of those for this particular course, but just know that if you do ever end up getting to a place where you're doing chi-square tests and you can't make this uh, assumption stick, then you wanna go ahead and pursue these alternative tests for the chi-square. Now, I wanted to show you a couple more examples of actual chi-squares and show you how we would interpret them. We can go back to this uh, study that we keep bringing up in the workshop about uh, by Buss et al. from 1992 on sex differences and jealousy. And you might remember that one of the things I told you is that their main finding, where they looked at how men and women differed in terms of whether they picked sexual infidelity or emotional infidelity as more upsetting, was actually analyzed using a chi-square test for independence. And so here's their chi-square test for independence. You can see that the chi-square value that they get is 47.56, the degrees of freedom is three, and the P is less than 0 0.001. So that is their chi-square, um, and that's how they reported it in the article. Now, what about us? What had happened in our particular chi-square? Well, in our chi-square, when I used our jealousy data from the 2016 1040 students, I also analyzed it using a chi-square. So you can see here, here are the frequency counts, how many men were upset about emotional infidelity, how many men were upset about sexual infidelity, and then how many women were upset about emotional infidelity and how many women were upset about sexual infidelity. And you can see the percentages. Remember, the men kind of equally picked emotional and sexual infidelity, but the women were much more likely to pick emotional than sexual. And sure enough, when I ran a chi-square test for independence here, the chi-square came out to be 11.60. So I reported it as chi-square bracket two for the degrees of freedom. The N was 214. That ended up giving us 11.60 for the chi-square, and that was a P that was definitely less than 0 0.001. So we, get, we did get this nice, big, robust effect in our jealousy data. Okay, that's it for the chi-square and all I wanna say about it. And of course, you're gonna get a chance to maybe practice some of these yourself. Um, I just wanna finish up this course by quickly reviewing with you some other kind of big picture issues about statistics so that you can kind of think a little bit more broadly about them. Um, the first of all, I want to just mention this distinction that you'll see that's in the textbook and others will make about parametric versus non-parametric tests. 
pretty much what we've been teaching you this semester have been parametric tests. So parametric tests are inferential tests that assume that the populations are normally distributed. You remember this was really important for the Z test, for the T test, and for our correlation um, analyses, that we are assuming that the populations were normally distributed. There are other kinds of tests that we haven't even taught you this semester that are called non-parametric tests. So these are inferential tests that don't assume that the populations are normally distributed. So these are other kinds of tests that you could learn about and that you could find in Jamovi or in R that can help be analyzed data where you know very clearly that your data are not normally distributed. This is a more of an advanced topic that you could either go and explore on your own or learn about in a future course. The other option, by the way, you have, if you don't really want to worry about this distinction, you might remember I mentioned you can also perform transformations of your data. You can do things like take the reciprocal or take the log of every score that you have to try to make your sample more like a normal distribution. And then therefore you would be making inferences about a population that would also went through that kind of transformation. That's one way that people get around this problem of, of the assumption of normally distributed um, populations so they can use their parametric test that we've taught you this semester. Now, what about choosing the right statistical test? So you can see that we've already been giving you this semester quite a few different kinds of tests that you could use. And it starts to get sort of confusing after a while to know when you have a particular data set that you've um, collected from your study, um, what's the right statistical test? So what I'm going to do now is just sort of give you a general overview of four major research questions that determine which statistical method to use. Okay, so this, some of these things we've covered this semester, other things are what we cover in the second and the third year of um, our research methods and statistics at UQ. So one question would be, what do the groups differ? So do you have different groups like an experimental group, uh, men versus women, whatever it is, do groups differ on some dependent variable? The second question would be, what is the degree of relationship among the variables? So you might have a research question where all you really care about is how much these variables are related to one another. The third question is something we haven't covered this semester, which is, what is the structural relationship among the variables? And finally, can we predict group membership? Okay, so these four questions, do groups differ? What is the degree of relationship among the variables? What's the structural relationship among the variables? And can we predict group membership? These four research questions, if you have that question as, as your major purpose of your research, that will determine which test you're gonna use. So let's take that first one, do groups differ? Now clearly this is one that's very commonly used in psychology, knowing how groups differ from some other score, from the population, from another group, and so on. And so what we learned this semester was the Z-test. We've also learned three different t-tests. We learned how to do a t-test for a single sample. We did a t-test for independent means, and we did a t-test for dependent means. So those are the major ones that you've covered in Psych 1040. When you go to second year, what you learn about is what's called ANOVA, or an analysis of variance. And there's different sorts of variations of analysis of variance or an ANOVA. Now the reason why you would do an ANOVA is when you have more than two groups in your design. Let's say you have three conditions or you've got two independent variables that are crossed with each other. If you only have one independent variable and it gives you like three or more different conditions, you would do what's called a one-way ANOVA to see if the means are different from each other. If you're going to take multiple independent variables and cross them with each other, so like for instance you have age, crossed by gender, then you would do what's called a factorial ANOVA. So that's another kind of ANOVA. And then finally, there's an ANOVA where you could do everything within subjects, or you can even do it as a mixed design where one of the independent variables is between and one of them is within. But anyway, there's this repeated measures within subjects design as well. And then finally, there's mixed. So all of these are different kinds of ANOVAs that you learn about in second year and allow you then to look at other kinds of designs that have more than two conditions. You can also do what's called an analysis of covariance, which is an ANCOVA, abbreviated. And the goal here is to try to estimate the effect of some unwanted variable, like a covariate, and then remove the variance associated with it from the analysis of the effects in which you're interested in. So one kind of covariate might be, for instance, um, age. So you want to make sure that age isn't uh, having an influence on your analyses. So you have everybody's age entered as a covariate and allows you to kind of remove how much of the variability is due to age to see if you still have an effect overall in your experiment. 
Now, I also will put the chi-square test in there because the chi-square test allowed us to look at how groups differ too, right? So this is more about frequency data um, for nominal variables, but the chi-square test would also go under this question of do groups differ. There's also um, what's called MANOVA and MANCOVA. These are called multivariate analyses of variance and covariance. These are used when you have multiple t-dependent variables that measure the same thing. You see, everything we've been covering this so far this semester has just been cases where we had one dependent variable, really, and we looked at how that one dependent variable differed between the different groups. If you're going to go ahead and take two or three or four different dependent variables at the same time that you think they're all related to each other, and you want to see how the groups are different from each other, then you would do a MANOVA or a MANCOVA. So this analysis creates what's called a linear combination of the variables as sort of a single DV to test in the analysis. Now the second question, what is the degree of relationship among variables? This is clearly what we were covering at the last lecture when we were looking at the Pearson R. So here we had two dependent variables and we wanted to see how they're related to each other in a bivariate relationship. We'd use a Pearson R. There's also something related to the Pearson R, which is called a rank order test. And this would be, for example, the Spearman row. This is where you have ranks. Um, you have purely ordinal data, and you want to see if the ordinal data is correlated with another variable. And it looks very much like a correlation. We didn't have time to cover it this semester, but the Spearman row is very much related to the Pearson R. There's also something called the point by serial R. This is when one of, your, one of your DVs is dichotomous and the other one is continuous. And so you can actually do a point by serial this way. So you could have like, for instance, um, sex, male and female, and then see how it's related to some continuous variable. That would be a point by serial R. You can have a partial R, which is the association between two variables, considering the influence of other variables. The strategy would be to partial out or control for the effects of the other variables. There's also multiple regression and regression. I talked about this a little bit at the last lecture. This is when you have multiple dependent variables that are used to try to predict another dependent variable. And so multiple regression allows you to assess the effects of different combinations of DVs separately, perhaps to assess a covariance effect when we're using what are called sequential regression methods. And there's several of these. There's something called a hierarchical multiple regression. There's a stepwise multiple regression. So what the computer program is doing here is it's choosing an order based on which variable should be entered and have the greatest effects of making predictions. Um, so these regression steps are evaluated by examining how much variance, and the variance is called R squared, on the outcome variable that they predict. Now this topic, everything you see on this slide, is really left for third year. So this is what you can look forward to in two courses from now. Then the third question would be, what's the structural relationship among the variables? And this is where you get into factor analysis. This is when you have a very large number of variables. And so, for instance, let's imagine you ask 30 questions about how people deal with emotional experiences in their everyday life. Like, when I get angry, I feel like I'm going to explode. When I'm sad, I cry. I don't get emotional when I hear something really good or bad. I talk to other people when I'm upset. People can't tell when I'm upset. So imagine you have all of those questions and people make ratings on all of those different items. What you can do then is do a factor analysis on that to see if some of those items are more related to each other than others. So it's kind of like correlations, except it's sort of like looking for a structure here to see if some of these variables might be more related to each other and other variables are more related to each other and they between them might be not related to each other. So a factor analysis assesses how much different variables are correlated with one another and not correlated with each other, considering the effects of all of these on each other simultaneously. Some of these items are found to clump together as factors. Now this method of factor analysis came out of psychology. It was developed by people who were interested in assessing the nature of intelligence. So it's going back to people like Galton and Pearson um, and those and their followers who are trying to understand how many different factors underlie intelligence, things like your spatial ability, your verbal ability, and so on. So factor analysis, again, is something we save for the third and if you go on and do a fourth year that you learn more about. Um, so it's a very advanced topic. There's also this stuff called causal modeling that allows you to um, um, test individuals on many variables. However, beyond just assuming that the variables are correlated, this type of analysis tries to determine whether a variable causes effects on another variable. Now, you remember that adage that correlation does not apply causality? Well, 
causal model modeling is trying to infer causality as best as it can, even though the data are kind of correlational. And structural equation modeling is probably the most common type of causal modeling, which again, you learn more about in later years here at UQ. The fourth question that you could ask about your data is, can we predict group membership? And there are a lot of choices here. These would include things like logit analysis, discriminant functions, and a logistic regression. So the example might be that you're trying to determine whether or not someone might become a criminal based on a bunch of predictor variables that you have. And so the predictors could be things like family income, their education, biological factors like the resting heart rate. And what you would do is you'd have like a large data set that you could analyze to help you determine whether or not people become criminal. And then these predictors could be simultaneously combined and analyzed to predict that outcome, much like we do in multiple regression, but it's done in a, a logistic regression. So that's our fourth question. I don't believe that this one is covered in our undergraduate statistics in psychology, but it could be something that you could learn about more in an advanced course. So with that said and showed you kind of the future and how we've just only begun to um, really understand some of the statistics that we use in psychology, I'm going to leave you here. This is the end uh, where I uh, let go and pass you off to the next person so you can learn more about statistics and psychology and also research methods. I thank you very much for um, watching these lectures and taking part. Um, that's all I have. And again, in the future, if you ever want to try to find me, um, I do have an email address, which I didn't put up on here, but I'm available upon Twitter. So go follow me now on Twitter. You can always see me there. Um, I also have a lab webpage, and I hope to see you in the future. Thank you very much. Bye.